out of college, I went to go be a newspaper reporter in Washington. And I was there when Congress was debating cat catastrophic care and long-term care led by the late Senator Claude Pepper. And that really caught my imagination. I, it's such a huge problem. How do you solve it? And you'll see that 25 years later, we, we still haven't solved it. And so I left uh, work to go get a master's degree in public health at Boston University and immediately went to go work for CNN. So I've been at CNN for 21 years now. And this is where you say, 21 years? Did you start when you were 12? <laughs> and I say, thank you. That's so nice of you. So for the first uh, 13 years or so at CNN, my mission was very clear, which is to, to deliver health news in a way that was accurate, that was understandable to my audience, and in a way that was compelling and that inspired them to take this information and make good choices. And that was a terrific mission and still remains my mission. But I added something to it about eight years ago. Hold on a sec. OK. Oh, so fun when these things work. So that's me and my third daughter, Sheer, right after she was born. And she was born, thank God, healthy. But when she was 48 hours old, she started to have seizures. In Atlanta, we call it the tomahawk chop. She started doing this. I had no idea how she knew that she was in Atlanta. And that's what you're supposed to do. But she knew. But then she did something you're not supposed to do, with the, which is that her face turned blue and seizures. And it was a, obviously a very scary time. And she was brought back to the neonatal intensive care unit. And one of the things they did was they gave her um, spinal taps because you need to make sure there's not an infection. So they did this for uh, a day or two and then they said to us, the neurologist, the pediatric neurologist called me in, in my hospital room and told my husband and me, hey guess what, she doesn't have an infection, we feel confident about that, we're going to stop the spinal taps. And when you go in the morning, they'll, they'll be done, they'll be over. And also, we're going to stop. They were sedating her very heavily. She sort of lay there like a rag doll. And they said, and we'll stop sedating her so heavily starting right now. And when you go in the morning, you're going to see a much more with it kind of baby, not a baby who's just lying there. So my husband went home to go take care of her two big sisters. And at early the next morning, I went to go see her in the NICU. And instead of seeing a much more with it baby, she was the same kind of rag doll baby that she had been since they'd been giving her the barbiturates. And I said to the nurse, what's going on here? She's supposed to be kind of more awake. The barbiturate dose was supposed to be lowered. And the nurse said, no, there was no order to do that. And I said, well, I hope there was an order to discontinue the spinal taps, because you were supposed to stop those. And she said, no, there was no order to discontinue the spinal taps. And I said, check the chart. You'll see it's there. We spoke to the neurologist last night. And she checked the chart, and she said, there was no order to discontinue. And they just did one an hour ago. And I said, well, they were not supposed to. And she said, oh, and, and now I'm seeing that she was dehydrated, and they couldn't get fluid out, so they're doing another one in an hour. And I said, no, they're not supposed to. We, I know that these were supposed to be stopped. You're supposed to stop doing these. And she, I started to cry and to become, I never liked the word hysterical, but I think I probably was hysterical. And she said, well, it's 7 o'clock, and there's no visiting between 7 and 8, and you need to go. And I knew that that was true, because her two big sisters have been in the NICU, too. But I sat myself in a chair, and I said, I am not leaving here. And she took my arm, and she guided me out the door. And I left, which was my first mistake. And when I got back up to my room, I was so hysterical that the nurses, these lovely nurses, kept coming in and trying to calm me down. And they wanted to know what was wrong. And I couldn't, I couldn't talk. Eventually, a nurse came in named Sarah. She calmed me down enough that I could tell her what had happened. And she said, that's bullshit. She left the room. Five minutes later, I got a call from the NICU saying, hey, don't worry. We're not going to do that spinal tap. We haven't done it yet, and we're not going to do it. And she was, she was, to this day, my angel. And I have no idea how she managed to do that in five minutes, but it worked. And what I learned from that experience was that things can go wrong 
even when you have the best doctors, and the doctors were terrific, even when you're in a good hospital, the hospital was you know, highly respected, huge, huge baby hospital, because it's a big system, and things don't always go right. So when I got back to work after my maternity leave, statistics that I was seeing meant something different to me. If you take it, just listen to these. One in 10 diagnoses that you'll receive from your doctor will be wrong, and that's a conservative estimate. One out of 14 abnormal test results will, the doctor or whoever will fail to tell the patient about them. The patient won't find out. And that's an abnormal test result. So that's not, oh, it's fine, you don't have strep. This is, oh, you do have whatever. One out of 14 times that result does not get delivered to the patient. Seven patients a day in the hospital have what are called body part mix-ups, which means you're in to get your tonsils out, but they put you to sleep and they take out your appendix because the guy in the room next door is getting his appendix out and they confused you. Or you're supposed to have your right leg amputated and instead you get your left leg amputated. Anything, any variation along that theme. Seven patients a day. And there are 100,000 deaths due to hospital-acquired infections. So these are folks who go in, into the hospital without an infection and catch a bug from the hospital and die from it. And having, having had this happen to, to people that I know personally, it's, it's often couched in terms of the person's illness, that they died of whatever they were in the hospital for, when really when you look at it, they died of an infection that they got in the hospital, often from something invasive like a catheter. So I looked at those statistics and I decided to add to the mission that I had started out with. And I uh, started a brand called The Empowered Patient, which was, uh, uh, it's been a column on .com, it's um, on CNN TV, and then I wrote a book called The Empowered Patient also. And it has to, in order to qualify as an empowered patient issue, it has to have two components. And two things that we want to tell our readers and our viewers, one is, there's a problem and you may not know about it because you never know about these things till you get sick, right? I mean, up until I, I had my children, I thought everything was rosy. And number two, there has to be something that you can do about it. So I'm going to quickly go through and tell you some of the people I've met on this empowered patient journey. So this is Albert Wu, who's a doctor at Hopkins who actually studies these issues. And his wife was pregnant in the hospital, was given a medicine, and then a nurse came in to give her the same medicine again. First was in an IV form, then they came to give her a pill, and he said, uh, no, I think you should check that. This is John Tonic, who started having headaches. He was a 16-year-old wrestler, perfectly healthy, and uh, to make a long story short, the pediatrician in two different visits said, you're dehydrated, you have a virus, and the mom said, Some, this is weird. He never gets headaches like this. He never acts like this. Took him to the emergency room. He had a brain tumor. Um, he went to the Cleveland Clinic, and the type of tumor that he had, 50-50 chance of living. And I'm happy to say he is still alive. But that teaches, that teaches me, go with your gut. Dr. Wu teaches me, be vigilant in your hospital and make sure you get the medications you're supposed to. This one, I'm so glad nobody's eating. This is a, the gut of a man with ulcerative colitis. Again, to make a long story short, he had sort of reached the end of the treatment road, was told there wasn't any really good treatment left for him or one that he wanted to do. And so he learned that people in developing countries really don't have ulcerative colitis, nothing near the rates that we have in this country. And so he, there's a theory that it's because many people in developing countries have um, intestinal worms. So he went to Thailand. I won't go into the gory details because they are gory. He got intestinal worms in a developing country and he ingested them and his ulcerative colitis went away. When you do imaging now of his gut, the, the signs of ulcerative colitis, they're all the inflammation, it's all gone. So what this teaches me is hopefully you don't have to do something like that, because that's pretty extreme, but that your doctor will not always know every alternative out there that you need to do some research for yourself. And in closing, I want to make talk about the empowered patient. Many times I hear from doctors, and sometimes they're pretty nasty in comments, that I'm doctor bashing. And I am not doctor bashing or nurse bashing. Healthcare is a complex system. Doctors and nurses are under incredible pressure. Things do not always go right. And so we have to take the reins sometimes. And it doesn't matter how, what kind of insurance you have, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. You may be the person who saves your own life or the life of someone you love. <laughs>